Uh, so this was actually a request and um, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this stuff because um, I think that obviously baggage has been a big thing that, that has been going on. Um, I think we've all collected a lot more baggage in this past two plus years, two years, I guess now. Uh, and so uh, really talking about that and what, what can we do? So the objectives, uh, we're gonna talk about the types of baggage that students bring. Uh, and, and really, again, being aware that these are always potentially things that, that the adults bring and how helping the students drop their baggage can improve the academic success. So really looking at those, how they go together, because they absolutely go together. We can't separate out children from academics, behavior, emotions, all of those things. Uh, so if I, and then we're going to talk about strategies for students to feel safe and kind of allow them and really help them um, not just, again, emotionally, but these are also strategies that you can use academically uh, and you can embed these. So hopefully you're going to get a lot out of it. Sorry, my printer is doing some kind of checking in or whatever, updating. So uh, just kind of some housekeeping as well. Please uh, feel free to type in the chat. You can also raise your hand. I want if you have any questions feel free to um, type those in. And like I said, you can also uh, raise your hand. So what kind of baggage do you all bring? So when you think of, you know, over the past two years, what kind of baggage uh, do you think both you, your staff, the kids, what kind of baggage do you think is coming up? These are just some examples. When you first think of baggage, what comes up for you all? Just type it in the chat. Exhaustion, Whew. yeah, trauma, absolutely. Doreen, I can relate that long list. Preconceived ideas, huh? Uh, that's a great one. J is it Jan, can you just type in a little bit more about that one? Uh, that's a good one. I just wanna make sure I'm clear on it. Balancing commitments, overwhelmed. Yeah, I definitely think we're, we're all carrying bags way more than we have in the past. Um, you know, our unintentional biases, yes. Ooh, very good one. Uh, that's something, you know, again, I think there, that's been a political thing. So, you know, there are, there are so many different things. Again, these are just a few of the baggage. But if you think about the kids that come to school, you know, what does that mean? What is the baggage? What is it that, that we're all bringing? Um, and, and this is kind of the, the definition. It's the combination of insecurities and inhibitions emerging from our upbringing um, and, you know, from that any family history, how we were uh, raised within our family, within our communities, uh, trauma, obviously, stressful situations, anything that we experience, really, whatever it is that we experience along the way, they, they all can potentially be baggage. And, you know, I, I always, um, you know, when we think of baggage, we do think of it as a, a very negative thing, though it doesn't have to be, and it's not necessarily always a negative thing. So hopefully I'm gonna give you a little bit of a different perspective. Um, and I know some of you have been in my presentations where I talked about, share my story, and I know I, ha I have had a lot of baggage and now I'm able to use it in a different way. So sometimes it's reframing and shifting. It doesn't happen overnight, but these are all some things, um, you know, the key is, is that they really become baggage when they are dragging us down, when they become the focus of our life so that we're not really able to function as well as we could be. So when they're really interfering with our life. So just kind of, you know, generally what we see is when we think and feel, we're in danger, our body automatically goes into survival mode. It, this is that fight or flight. Uh, it, it is fight, flight, freeze. There's also fawn. Fawn, which is really kind of trying to develop a relationship with a person, almost really clingy. And part of that is because you're just, they just are so needy for attention. And also that they look at the perpetrator, um, that that really 
can um, that you know it's all they know that may be all they know and so they want to just have a relationship so Doreen from yesterday's session if you change the way you look at things the the things you look at change absolutely great that's a great quote and and if you look for bad things you're gonna find them and if you look for the good you're gonna find them as well um Laura Riffles uh the inner your your attention goes where your energy flows so if you put more energy into and something negative and negative emotions and and you know not saying we ignore it it's just let's look for what are the positives that are going on and 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 i can tell you it's easy to get caught up that's how we all kind of approach things to get stuck in the negative um so this is just kind of from the child perspective do you know where i learned to be brave school it's a really scary place we don't always realize that school can be a positive and it can be a negative for kids so we have to be aware of that especially if they're getting bullied so when we talk about kind of sources of baggage these are all i'm not going into this is a you know whole other training but these are all around trauma uh, on the left side are those aces the adverse childhood experiences that were the original part of the study and then uh the bottom part on that left are kind of some of the expansion that has happened so um the the pair of aces and really looking at social cultural environment physical environment economic environment all of those aspects and then some of the things that are now being studied a little bit more on the on the right are um you know we see foster care bullying uh, a, a family died separation for obviously for immigration any of those things um you know really looking at all of these aspects that these are all sources of of uh, baggage and i want to kind of point out this intergenerational transmission trauma does not go away it really is um you know if we don't deal with it that doesn't say it doesn't go away it, it's it's if we don't really look at it and deal with it if we don't tend to the roots the tree is not going to bear fruit so it's really important. I see Wendy likes that, that graphic. Yeah, I just found this one recently and I love it too. I'm like, ooh, that's really powerful uh, in terms of especially because it has us looking at where we're going uh, and just recognizing these things. So just kind of a, a very quick and actually I'm going to stop sharing because I know I did not share sound. So I'm going to sh share again. And some of you may have seen this video clip, but this is kind of, um, oops, sorry. This video clip really is a quick and easy way in thinking of about what all of this does to our brains. What happened? Sorry. All right. So when I explain this to teenagers, I start with the hand model, okay? And I start by explaining that we're going to talk about the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain that everyone has. Formally, can you all see this video? I have a weird yeah. thought. Okay. Yes, we can. Sorry. So when I explain this to teenagers, I start with the hand model, okay? And I start by explaining that we're going to talk about the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain that everyone has. Formally, this is called the limbic system, and this is called the cerebral cortex. But what we're going to talk is downstairs brain and upstairs brain. So in your downstairs brain, this is where fight, flight, or freeze lives. Okay? When threat comes at you, your body has three reactions it can make. It can fight, it can run away, or it can stay very still until the danger is gone. That's what this brain does. Okay, this part of the brain. What's up here, the upstairs brain, its job, among many other things, is to solve problems, to help you calm down, solve problems, okay? And to tell the downstairs brain, I got this. We're gonna be okay. There's another solution. So what happens a lot of times to kids who've experienced trauma is if you think about these like muscles, because you've gone through a lot of threat, this downstairs part of the brain's been doing push-ups your whole life, okay? So this part of the brain's really strong. Part of your brain that solves problems hasn't had as much exercise because you've had to be really strong to be a survivor, a thriver. So what happens is, is that the brain gets what I call emotionally hijacked. This downstairs brain comes up on top of this brain. It takes over, okay? So the downstairs brain's in control. 
And so you fight, you run, you freeze. The only things that work when you're down here are things that calm you down. So they call them self-regulation skills. And that happens from connection. Somebody talking to you, helping you breathe, helping you feel your body calm down. Once that happens, then the upstairs brain can come back and then you can solve problems. So that's how I try to explain to teenagers the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain and what happens to them when they experience it. That's just a great kind of, you know, illustration of what it is, you know, and kind of what happens when kids um, have baggage that really is interfering. That's kind of the, what happens with the brain. Uh, you know, but, but thinking about why is it important to know? So I have baggage on my computer that I have no idea what this window has been. I've been trying to get rid of it. So uh, do you all see this little window down at the bottom or is, or is it just on my end that I'm seeing this? Yes, we can see it. <laughs> okay, I, it's driving me nuts, but it's so, it's baggage. Um, so we, um, you know, one of the key things, this is, we can only learn when the part of our brain is working well. You know, when we have, um, you know, it, when we're all stressed out, it's really hard to do our job. Uh, Tim Frank, uh, you had a, your hand up. Did you have a question or was that? You can go ahead and type it in the chat. Uh, but, but when kids are in survival mode, oh, okay, no problem. When kids are in survival mode, they're not gonna be able to really focus on learning. Let me stop sharing again and let me just try it one more time. Not working, all right. So that's what we know. And the problem is that it's really hard to see it Kids don't know, and honestly, adults do not know when they are in survival mode, unless you have really done a lot of work to have a lot of self-awareness, adults don't know that we are in survival mode. Like I've been saying the last two years, so many people are responding out of their own trauma. And we're not talking trauma that is, you know, life-threatening kind of trauma, just even the little collective traumas, uh, all the political turmoil, all, you know, and obviously now we have a war going on. Let's add more to it. Um, you know, the tornadoes and a lot of storms happening. So all of those things build up and that we don't realize that we're often responding out of our own trauma. And, and kids don't recognize that. So especially, uh, like I said, you know, unless they, well, kids generally don't because their brains are not functionally there and adults are really uh, struggling that. But to, for you to see, you know, that it is, it's like we have to recognize that this is not about a character trait. It's about, it's not a personality trait. It's about they are in fight or flight mode. What does that look like? You know, they want to feel okay. They want to feel normal. They don't even know what's going on. So it shows up. These are just some of the ways, really, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, kind of that formal diagnosis, um, having trust if issues. Trust is a huge piece because if we think about if kids don't feel that they can trust others, they're not going to um, let their guard down. Paranoia, which really can be something that is like um, hypervigilance. When we see with kids that, uh, you know, if they've been through a trauma, that they may be hyper vigilant to something happening, you know. So always on on edge, uh, being defensive, and and you know again, I especially see this more so in adults, where just in deflecting, um, you know. So sometimes it's we have to be careful to not just tell point out to people, hey, you're doing this and you're struggling with this. If we if we do that, that's going to actually put them on the defense, um, insecurity, and that you know, especially leads to that baggage showing up in relationships. Our closest relationships are really where they come in. Um, the baggage can do the most damage. So what are states? When we talk about a state, it's a state that our body gets in. And it's really kind of, you know, yes, this is the technical aspect, but our brain, there are things that happen in our brain that are not just physical, that the neurons are firing, but they're also that chemical response in our brain that is 
triggering the neurons to fire. So there are lots of different things that are going on. And when our brains are in that fight, flight, or freeze mode, there are all kinds of things going on. So the, the resources that are in our brain are being deflected to where the stress is, and they are not going to be in the upstairs part of our brain. So it kind of gives you that. But one of the things is that we want to look at how can we help? You know, how does it help for us to do um, help with this? And so when we talk about just brain-based teaching, this is kind of where we're really bringing in the socio-emotional learning, the, the trauma-aware into the academics, that this is kind of um, how we can really do some of that integration. It's that ESP, that the purposeful engagement of effective strategies derived from principles of cognitive neuroscience. You don't have to know the neuroscience if you just understand, you know, kind of if you understand that there's neuroscience going on, then using some of those strategies that are based on that are really going to be helpful. So I love this, that there is good news is that you really do have much more capacity to influence your students. We often think like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on. I don't, I can't even do anything. And, and so we, we kind of get into an all or nothing. And so we want to kind of step back and recognize that, you know what, we really can have an impact positively and always remind yourself of that. Uh, so one of the things is really about having an engaging classroom. That is really one way that you can help kids uh, to, to let down some of their guard, to have some of that baggage. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you're an entertainer. It, it's the goal is, you know, it is. It's a lot of times you as teachers are trying to do too many things. And sometimes what I do is I tell them, let's step back. Let's back up and just look at the big picture. Let's kind of look from a balcony view so we could recognize that, you know what, it's not about all the little details that we have to get done. Yes, they are there, but the most important thing is that how can you really reach the kids first? What can you do to reach those kids that maybe aren't engaged in learning, you know, and that that is our really our first priority. And the more that we can make learning fun and using some of these strategies that that we want to we want to work smarter, not harder and be much more efficient. Uh, and it's also going to help you. Like, for example, laughter, any way that you can embed laughter into your classroom is absolutely a stress release and it helps kids really with, with bringing their brains down to being grounded. Um, and so, you know, what we're gonna, uh, you know, continue to show more strategies. So the secret is, it, it is dozens of little things. It's, it isn't, again, the magic bullet. It is, what are the things that you're already doing? And really just noticing what are things that have worked in your classroom um, you know, even just looking at how timing is, how much time you're spending on something, maybe doing shortened blocks, like that alone can again help with calming situations, how we word things. And I mentioned, you know, sometimes if we're telling kids what they're doing wrong, it just is, it's shifting how we word things, that that can really uh, create some powerful uh, again, calming, calming uh, states in the classroom. It is, it's the little, little things that we, um, you know, we don't realize that we're often doing. And actually the, the human head is not in the slide. I took that out because I wanted to just get right into the strategy. So to succeed with all learners, we need to manage their emotional states. And again, you feel like that this may not necessarily be your job. It isn't that you have to be the psycho a psychologist. It is about feeling what's going on in the room, looking at what's going on around. So when we talk about, you know, a lot of times we have, we say, oh, well, there are so many kids that are, you know, that we have the good kids and then we have these other kids, but there really is no normal brain. This is kind of an interesting research study and looking at um, what, what does normal mean? Um, and so they screen subjects with an interview and the remaining, uh, so out of 1,685, 
the remaining had in-person history and physical exam. And of those original who considered themselves to be normal, only 10.7% of those actually had healthy brains. So, you know, again, we don't always realize how things are impacting us. There really is no normal. So kind of the new paradigm, this old paradigm of recognizing you know, that, oh, there are so many wonderful kids and, and it's not about, again, wonderful kids. It's, yes, they are. It's just, they all have some kind of baggage to some degree. And so, you know, historically we've looked at that we've got, you know, the typical kids, the most well-behaved kids are the bigger percentage and that those, um, those kids that are uh, the most challenged that we're generally, they're only a small percentage, but really what we know is that, that the kids with, um, you know, those most well-behaved kids with the healthy brains are only 10% of the kids that we work with. So kind of giving yourself a break as well as them, you know, that if we expect just, if we put the expectations too high that they can't ever reach them, then that alone uh, is going to be challenged. So we want to shift and kind of look at things. Uh, why, why should we manage these emotional states? Again, this baggage, they really contribute to disengaging kids from learning. That, that's it. it. You know, again, that, that downstairs brain hijacks the upstairs brain. The, those positive states emotionally improve students in their learning, in their cognitive tasks. They absolutely go together. And that young children's feelings about school improve when they feel more competent and also when they're engaged. The more engaged they are, that helps them feel more incompetent, which then helps them feel better about themselves. So just recognizing how the things that you do academically, again, I, I know that so many of you already recognize these things. It's just bringing a new perspective to it. Uh, fewer students have emotional regulation skills. We know that the kids, a lot of the kids that we work with, um, you know, if you think about, I, I know so many adults that don't have these skills. And, and it's, it's not that I didn't realize that before. It just is, it gets, beca it becomes more concrete that there are so many people um, that do not have a lot of these skills. There are less connection with parents. They're isolated, you know, especially now kids have been so much more isolated that they're not, they don't have those experiences. I remember I played outside, I played on teams, all of those things. I did learn a lot about social interaction in that way. Um, and that we, kids don't, aren't coming to school with it. Uh, and so, but what we know is that those skills, these are kind of, again, those soft skills really are powerful to having a big impact. You know, we know that again, past generations to where we are, it, it is, it is all over the place. You know, thinking about what is it compared to one or two generations ago? What is it that you think? Do you think students have the same, less than, or better emotional regulations? I kind of told you already, but based on your own perspective, what is it that you think in America or globally? Is it just an America thing? So type, go ahead and type in the chat. less. Yep. Yep. They are. They're definitely coming less. So when we think about, you know, again, what are those states? These are some of the states that we see. You know, can you identify, if you look at some of these, what do they look like in your classroom? Some of the pots, the green ones are actually positive states. You know, they can be, they can be helpful. Uh, confusion is helping kids to be more curious, curious, you know, when they're confused, teaching them that that's not a bad thing. Let's look at, okay, let's ask more questions. Let's teaching them to ask questions because they may not naturally ask questions. Um, people think posting on self, social media is self-regulating. Yeah. Like I said, a lot of adults, we've become dependent on our phones for self-regulation and then it just snowballs the whole situation. So what influences these states? So I want to kind of introduce this model to you all. This is, this is something that is 
Um, I've seen a lot of it. And, and, and just recognizing though, the brain seeks pleasure and avoids pain. This is, these are kind of, if we boil it down to the essence, this is how our brains are wired, is to seek pleasure and avoid pain. We, it, we're all like that. All of our brains are wired that way. So the SCARF model, has any, have any of you heard of the SCARF model at all? You can again type in the chat. It is a neuroscience model for leadership, though I'm kind of like trying to play with it and really put it into what does this look like in schools? Because I think it's such a powerful thing. So our brains are wired, this is by David Rock. Our brains are wired for status so that um, all of, you know, and I'm going to look at these, we're going to look at each of these things individually. So SCARF, status, certainty, autonomy, relatedness, fairness, our brains are wired for these things. And what happens is that the world is not supportive of these things. And so this is a big piece of what our brains do is that they get hijacked because these are some of the areas that really can impact our brain um, functioning. So status is that relative importance to others, whether it's within our family, within our classroom, within our colleagues or school or building, uh, whatever that is. But it is how important do we feel we are to others? Uh, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, we talked about social media that status may be people have the perception that, you know, being an, a YouTube influencer or Instagram, any of these things, that that brings them status. And so we've really kind of shifted how we think about status in many ways, yet it really is a temporary status. And it's, it's a two-way street in that this importance is, you know, we want to look at, is it really a two-way street? It's not just one or the other. Certainty. How do we know? You know, again, the last few years have been like a challenge and an uncertainty. We have um, really had, you know, we don't, we don't know what's going on from one day to the next, uh, you know, especially early on in the pandemic. Are we wearing masks? Are we not? Are we in school? Are we not? Like there have been so many things that have created. So being able to predict the future, that certainty has a big impact. Autonomy, being able to feel that you have control that self-control, self-determination over your environment. If and kids have less control over their environments, even more so than adults, though, you know, we have to recognize this is something that can really have a big impact. If kids are always being told what to do, then they're not going to feel kind of that calm sense of like, I feel competent. Um, the, the relatedness, a sense of connection to others, fairness perception of fair exchange. How are things, you know, am I being treated fairly compared to other people that are in my class? If there, or, you know, again, if for you as, as a worker, looking at how are you treated compared to your colleagues, that is um, powerful. I've left jobs because I felt, I did not feel that I was, um, you know, there were favorites. People were playing favorites and I was, I didn't feel at this one job that I was a fa was one of those favorites. And, and that really does damage to your um, self-esteem. It can, you know, so again, especially if all of these are interacting. So, so I'll just show you a really quick video. Hopefully it's going to work because I really want to get this out of there. Sorry, still having issues. In this video, I'm going to show you how anyone can quickly and easily create doodle videos, just like the one you. 
Sorry, I now have a commercial going. All right. One of the most interesting things about teamwork is that it seems like it should be easy, but All right, I'm having technical difficulties with that, so I will. So what can we do to prevent teachers? This is kind of a, uh, one of my colleagues that I worked with had said that our scarf was snagged. I'm like, that's a great quote, is your scarf snagged? So when you think about it, it's the acronym. You know, what is it that we can do to help prevent that from happening? So you can use the brain research. Again, it's not, you don't have to know all of the research. If you just recognize, you know, kind of, kind of again, that hijacking of our brain and what are some things as well as SCARF, using SCARF to think about what we can do to help support uh, kind of classroom management uh, that really supports all students and really helps them to learn more, both emotionally and cognitively. Uh, and, and help you to even think about differentiation differently and using that information to be more effective as a, as an, as a teacher. So, you know, again, just another piece of it is that genes actually have a less of an impact than the environment. So kind of some more good news. So there's hope that we can do a lot of this for really supporting and only kind of the, the, Yes, the genes are changed through trauma, and it's hard to see some of those changes immediate, immediately, but know that only high, highly consistency, consistent teachers and schools will see the benefits. The more consistent and the more we create safe environments where kids' scarf is really addressed, that alone is going to have a big impact. So every student regardless that we know that that they can improve um it's the key is knowing how to do it uh and we don't want to work hard it, it is about working smarter so yes we can actually improve all of these things perception memory intelligence and iq so this is again kind of connecting how that social emotional learning can improve academic it's just further further giving that uh, and this is kind of a, um, you know, IQ isn't fixed and sustained positive environments actually work. So this is kind of just a study uh, that, they, that you can gain IQ. So summarizing in that brains are unique. So it's good for us to have a variety and we baggage isn't a bad thing. We're going to get into really some of the strategies, but wanted to summarize that brain science. So brains can change so every student can learn. So how can we do that? What are some things that we can do? So this, you, you, ask, you also have a, a handout, but this is kind of the SCARF model in terms of the definition. So status, it is what it, we are constantly looking at. Are we important to others? Are we important to our friends? You know, think about your own experiences. Um, I'm the youngest of seven. And so I always was like, I'm not, you know, I, I didn't feel like I was all that important. And it, and it, you know, it's obviously I didn't have status in my family. So that was um, a barrier for me early on. Um, and a reward is when, you know, this is what kids will gravitate towards or adults when kids are feeling like we are part of a team and they're included in the decisions or activities you know when we when we have them like let's do this together so anything that fosters collaboration can help with improving status uh so a threat the pain of being left out you know it, it's it can be real just as the pleasure of being included is also real all of those things are absolutely absolutely having an impact so certainty you know, again, being able to predict the future or at least to have a sense of assurance when there are changes that are happening. If we, you know, communicate in advance, like, okay, 
this is what's going to happen. Now we can't control everything, but the more we can do that, that's going to have a big impact. So, you know, knowing what's coming up, that clear communication is that reward that kit will help support um, certainty. And then not knowing when we have inconsistency, an inconsistent communication, an inconsistent environment. You know, the more we can, you know, like I said, you can't control everything, but when we at least communicate that things are going to be changing, and this, like I said, goes for leadership, um, that the, if leadership is communicating to staff, then that also helps with, um, you know, we want to make sure staff's scarf is not sagged. Uh, autonomy, that sense of control, whatever way that we have that, you know, um, feeling that we have choices, the more we can give choices, in anything academic, that alone is really going to help. Asking others, asking us what we want, you know. So, hey, what would you like? To, how would you like to do this? Asking for differentiation. How would which which group would you like to be in? You know, and you may not do that with individual students at the time, but if you do something like a preference survey, you're going to be able to identify their preferences for learning. The more preference surveys that you do. Um, the, the threat is when you're being micromanaged, you know, being talked at or always told what to do. Those are things that are not supportive of autonomy. Relatedness, that having a sense of belonging and safety, that feeling part of a group. So again, it's kind of coming back to the we, though it is um, really about those relationships. That it's, it's the culture of having trust, having friendliness, having confidence in other people around you. Whereas the threat would be if there's too much consolate, um, competition and it's isolation. Like I said, with COVID, we've been isolated. If it's us versus them, we see silos. Um, you know, the fairness then is really having that fair exchange between people and having kind of group norms. What are the same rules and, expect and expectations with those clauses of flexibility. You know, obviously we want to have a foundation. Um, and I see Jan, uh, thanks. I'm glad that this is kind of resonating with you. It's, it's again, it's a great way, a great quick way to think about our classrooms. Um, you know, so that fairness, when we are communicating when someone is getting special treatment and why. I have twin granddaughters and we, uh, one of them has ADHD and the other one, um, you know, we, we, we've had to make sure, all right, if she's getting something special because we're trying to get her to take her medication, let's also do something with the other one to make sure, yes, she needs something different here, but what can we support the other one, which may not be a strength for her? It's not always just about special treatment. It's about individual preferences and again, giving some choices. Um, yes, the slide should be, I did, I just, got them to her yesterday so they but they should be up there i'm pretty sure she she was able to share them so if not you'll have my email and i will get them to you but yes they should be um so again having clear ground rules kind of expectations up front the more you do that this is kind of coming back to if you're doing something like school-wide positive behavior support if you have a good classroom management um, that alone can really help with creating that fairness and helping people's brains to kind of come down. Um, Lori posted the link. Um, playing favorites is a threat where, uh, you know, I mentioned that I left a job because of that and, and that it's more about personal preferences. And it was very obvious that people were being treated differently. That's very, um, you know, it's disconcerting. So looking at this, so thinking about Using that SCARF model, what are some strategies that you are already doing that can support these? And I, and I have a tool that actually we're going to look at, but I want you to type in the chat, what are some things that you are already doing that would help support this? Again, these are just sort of examples, uh, but the, it, it gives you kind of that picture. So type, go ahead and type in the chat. If any of you, again, if you want to um, raise your hand and it, you can unmute maybe so what strategies do you use to support autonomy even 
giving choices. What are you already doing? Let students make choices. Perfect. Responsible for certain tasks. Yeah. If you kind of, you know, communicate, give them all of the tools to be able to be responsible. And this is kind of where, you know, helping them be successful, scaffolding so that they're successful, that helps also build their status. So that those, these are simple things that are brain-based strategies, setting expectations. Yep. The schedule, you you already have your schedule. Uh, yes, IEPs, asking kids for their input, you know, and this doesn't even mean just those kids that are the more, you know, uh, that are older. The, the, we want it really preference assessments alone across all age levels and grade levels, even if kids are not able to communicate in some ways, finding out, looking at them, what are they doing? What are we observing them doing that can help me know that they are interested in that? If you see kids that are gravitating towards something, that is going to tell you that they're more interested in that. Um, so all of those are things, you know, and I'm going to give you a tool that is going to help you to look at what is it that I'm already doing. Um, restorative conversations. Absolutely. That is a great example. So, you know, again, things that you're already doing. This is not about adding a whole bunch of new things. It's looking at what you already have and, and putting a different frame on it. So now we're going to actually look at, you know, as I said, so if we look at SCARF and helping to support students' SCARF, that is what is going to help us manage the students' states. It's a mouth tongue twister. So we want to help do that proactively because that alone is going to really prevent problem behaviors as well as then it builds these skills of helping kids to understand their own preferences and strengths and giving them um, more control that also lowers your own stress. So let's look at some of these. So strategies that specifically look at building status. Student responsibilities, and I know you, some of you have talked about, and again, they're not always gonna be, there are gonna be things that you do that actually may be able to go across the different SCARF categories. So, you know, keeping kids busy, not just boring, busy work, but helping them to be engaged with whatever it is that you're doing, you know, and, and we're going to look at some things. They can be, you know, we could be giving them tasks, giving them jobs, you know, taking care of the class music, uh, anything, you know, it's really about delegating. The more you as a teacher can really have things delegated well and that you can give the students those responsibilities, they can absolutely, real. they can not only help you, but they are then helping to build student status. Leadership and announcement roles and, and having kids rotate through these different things, asking them what it is that they really enjoy. Um, class chores, energizers and stretching. You know, maybe it is that they get to select what it is. I use brain breaks a lot where, you know, maybe it's the different students get to select and maybe they earn selecting that. That again gives them status. Um, student juries, back to the restorative conversations. You know, these are just some examples of how you can give students responsibilities. Uh, and so when you have those kids that maybe are slow responders, they may not necessarily be um, engaging. They may be um, not wanting to engage in some of these things. This is kind of back to, we really want to look at, okay, what are those things that they're interested? As I talked about preference assessments, um, you know, building relationships and just asking, what is it that you like? They may not like to be asked in a large group. So let's do, you know, let's do a quick survey, a little piece of paper or a Google form. Uh, you could do a variety of different things, but you know, just little baby steps. Sometimes it's it's just very simple things, you know, that you can say, um, you know, what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Really just very, very basic. That is a way to engage them. You know, again, it, it's little baby steps, but 
if we do, you know, we get one engage engage in a variety of ways. So never, ever give up hope of reaching those kids, because as soon as you give up, they do, too. They can feel it. So we want to just kind of pick things. So I already talked about kind of that small little things. Um, a small change in a pile can destabilize the entire pile. So often a small state can change in a positive way can reap dividends. So for those slow responders, you know, again, sometimes we, we do want to throw our hands up with them. But if we can change their state, even for, you know, a few minutes, that that can really have a positive impact. You know, those frequent micro state changes. So again, it's not saying that, okay, the rest of the day is going to be wonderful. It could literally be a, a minute of change. And the more you build up those little baby steps and minutes, they build up, they, they accumulate. So the more often you keep kids engaged, it gets easier. Um, you know, they're not going to get as lethargic. So use it. Brain breaks are really a powerful way to do all of these things. Um, that could be a whole other training, which I've done that as well. But um, so some other strategies, doing some grounding exercise, mindfulness exercise, you know, helping them to do deep breaths, breathing alone and doing it throughout the day. That is a very powerful way. And you're, you're, it's engaging, it's active engagement. You know, again, if we talk about good instruction, active engagement, this is just showing how it really has an impact. Um, angle your chair. Uh, so you angle your chair to face others. So now you're part of group of four. So again, rearranging just environments, some th simple things like that. Let's vote. How many of you think option one? How many think option two? You know, again, very, very simple. How I'm and having you type in the chat, any engaging things. You want to continually involve them as much as possible. Um, you know, write this down. So even if it's the only thing you write down all day, it, it could literally, you know, if you just say that to students, like, okay, this is a really important point. I want you to write this down. It, during your instruction, if you're doing that, that alone, again, is a little micro state of getting kids engaged and you're helping to build that, that status uh, for them and kind of calming them down. Looking at your neighbor's paper and um, if the assignment written correctly, say, great job. So, you know, partner sharing, count off by tables, again, very simple. It's part of how you operate your classroom. It is an engagement strategy. So giving yourself credit. You repeat it. Their brain gets bored. They repeat it. Learning strikes a chord. I love this. I was like, so it's Jensen learning. That was that's a great one. Because again, the more we can get kids to repeat things back to us and not just repeating. And the key is, is that this is, again, the more often the better. And this is how they learn. Looking at culture and these states. So culture influences the learning of our emotional states. You know, being sensitive, back to the, the you know, un, unexamined biases and being aware of that, that they really do. We have to, it's important for us to look at it because that's going to influence how kids interact with us. It's back to that status. Um, and that the younger students really don't consciously choose the states. And so, you know, being aware of what are the differences. There are some exceptions. You know, there are going to be kids who absolutely, especially those kids that are more introverted, that they are not going to be one as, as engaged. Engaging doesn't always have to be just verbal. Engage. It can be writing. It can be, you know, even just standing up. Very simple things. We want to keep it. Maybe it's them going over and taking a break. That is engaging, you know, and then we just want to kind of check in to see if there's anything else that we can support. Student empowerment. So helping them to manage their own states. These are some things, physical activity, better nutrition, naps. I'm a big proponent of naps. Like obviously we can't take them in school. And I love NAS. I will take it anytime I can. Doing service work, you know, pleasure reading. So that could be kids reading a comic book that is, you know, about a superhero. 
just the fact that they're reading for entertainment can really help the, build their status. Um, giving them busy work. Now, again, the more we can give them positive busy work rather than just boring busy work, that and that's you know that ideally is going to be a way to build. So these states, and I've kind of already talked about it, is that they are these states are not um, if they, if we're not addressed. If we aren't addressing these states, they're not, they're not going to be able to learn. That's the essence that when we do that, it makes your life easier and it also really builds their confidence. Um, and so this may be that we're then starting to kind of guide that. We want to see different states. We can build on it. You know, but first is uh, what are we going to do and just recognizing them. So the next part is certainty. Rituals, using rituals, again, routines, anything that you already have in your classroom, prearranged events. We want to have things that are going to be part of how you operate. We want to keep them simple, engage everyone and that there's a, a, a recurring problem. So if a problem is keeping materials organized use that and create a ritual create a routine if any of you are familiar with champs the champs workbook um is a randy sprick it is a template and i think wendy chalmers i think we probably talked about this many many years ago it helps you to outline your expectations for different activities in your classroom um you know so that it can help you to plan and then it helps you to communicate um, and then ending in a positive state at the end of whatever ritual. Uh, so when we look at kind of criteria, we have procedures versus rituals. This is the criteria. Um, you know, we have procedures that may not always engage every single student and they may be more complex. Rituals, these are the criteria that we want to keep in mind. Um, builds community, predictable, ends in a positive state, all of those things. And they can really influence states. These are just some examples of some of the rituals. <clears throat> you know, I already talked about kind of that, you know, brain breaks, visitor interruptions, um, you know, starting the class. How do we operate when these things are happening? You know, and that how are we going to do team activities? All these are things that you want to identify, celebrations, all of those things. Some more to get a class at um, class attentions. You, yeah to get a class's attention, clapping three times. I uh, often use, if you can hear me, raise your hand, um, you know, so that I speak in a normal voice that is not too loud. So if somebody in the back room, if they can hear me, they're listening. You know, any, any kind of thing, um, when the student classes, it really kind of gives that boost of that certainty because it's something that they know they're gonna respond to. I saw a teacher do some of these things, did a great job. Um, of using this in our classroom. Again, they're very simple and easy. Um, you know, if you made it here on time, raise your hand and say whatever it is. Say yes. Now turn to your neighbor and say happy Monday. It's a great day to learn. So, you know, just a way to engage kids. Uh, success with rituals. This is where you're all collaborating. You may have a variety of different people that you're really working towards. Um, but we want to use them. So it's not just in your classroom. You want to get them more school, school wide. Um, think about what are some possible rituals. Just really quick. Are we going to 115 or is it one o'clock that we're ending? I think it is one o'clock. It's one o'clock. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. So autonomy, giving kids that a sense of autonomy. I have all of these are different tools that you can use for helping to create autonomy and giving kids ways to, to help. One, two, three, then me, so that they give one minute to go over the instructions um, silently, uh, two minutes to discuss it with a partner, and then three minutes to plan before they then come talk to you. Again, these are some things that help with building that. Things that foster relationships, uh, these rules, and actually these, this is the answer that it's respect, relationship and hope, giving kids hope. They will know that hope can really change your brain. 
again, it, it is a way to really help build those relationships and helping them look at what is it that I want to focus on so that I'm not just focusing on my weaknesses. And then strategies that foster fairness, contracts, having, um, you know, classroom expectations, a code of conduct, um, that you have those things in your classroom, you know, keeping just kind of some key tips, making sure that we as adults are modeling what it is. We're saying, we're, we're, we're doing what we're saying. We're making sure, you know what, I, I messed up on that. We're taking responsibility for our own behavior. That is again, helping with fairness. Um, you know, these are kind of some ways to strengthen a, con, um, a contract. Just some key things. I'll let you do this if or when you do this. Offer support and help each other re reaching goals. Um, we want to avoid rhetorical questions like, well, what was the purpose of doing that? And you didn't really want to say that. So sarcasm is not good. Um, and reinforcing students. Uh, so, you know, kind of another reflection. What are you already doing? Um, I've already talked about hope. Uh, and so just kind of some key things. So one final note, spending just a small amount of time making me feel safe really activates part of the thinking brain. So if we can help students feel safe, it really can create life-changing differences for them. And it helps with turning off their, that part of their brain that is gonna trigger them. So one last really quick thing, I am gonna share a document. Um, that I have, hold on. Um, so there is a worksheet. So here's my, con here's my contact information, by the way. And there is also a worksheet. And essentially what it is, is it's that SCARF worksheet and it has, um, what are the things that I already do? So it's a way for you to look at what am I doing in the classroom? What are things that I already do? What would I like to do? So it basically is just adding two columns to the right side so that you can look at, it's a worksheet for you to look at how can I use these in my classroom?